Oh man. Just, just listen. Just listen. Just listen. Just listen. I'm not. Um, well, I'm... you would if it were playing. Just listen to the sustain. Oh, I'm not hearing anything. It's famous for its sustain. You would if it were playing. I mean, you could you could go away. So well, well, I mean, so you don't. You, uh... you could go away and have a bite, and, and you'd still be hearing that one. Oh man! Hey guys, oh, welcome to that paddle show ten here. Mick here. Hello, lamest gag ever. <laughs> wonderful. It still works, though, right? Absolutely wonderful. Yeah. Oh boy, that had to happen. Yeah, had to happen. We just want to say um, thank you to Spinal Tap. Oh man, years of joy, just endless joy, endless, isn't it? Sustain, sustain, sustain. It's I. We watched Spinal Tap before lockdown with uh, Rabia. First time he'd ever seen it. Couldn't believe it. And I remember that gag. And I started thinking about it. We, we've talked about compression a lot, but we've never talked about sustain. And, and it's such a buzzword around guitar. And when you think about it, how, I mean, like a sustained note how often do you ever hear a guitar player really, you know, yeah. long, sustained note? And how, why is that such a prerequisite? Yeah, for why a do we care about exactly. it so much? Like, if you read any guitar review, um, particularly with acoustic guitars, actually, they'll, they'll talk about sustain um, like this holy grail of stuff. And there are plenty of guitar makers down the years who, you know, pursue sustain yeah. as. The, the Holy Grail. Exactly. I mean, Paul Reed Smith is one. He he regards sustain in very high, um, you know, in high value. Les Paul, what was he looking for when mm. he attached those wings onto the log? Yeah, right. His first experiment was apparently was with a piece of railroad track. Right. Sustained forever. Right. Sounded awful. <laughs> Just in, kept it, going. You know, paraphrased. Miles in, and miles. And <laughs> <laughs> paraphrased in his words. So... To we're going to get into it a bit. We're going to... We, what? He had to train a coming. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so we're going to talk about sustain and we're going to ask a few key questions about sustain. So first off, what is sustain? Yeah. What is it? Okay. So think about... Um, think about a, a woodwind, a, a sax player or a violin... When they hit that note, they can hold that note as long as they like, right? Same amplitude, same level, that's sustain, right? The, the length of the note. Guitar is different. We have this, like, really high transient. And after that, then we have, you've got basically your four elements. Um, ADSR, you've got your attack, your decay, your sustain, and then your release, right? So in the world of guitar, which, which apparently synth people will know, controls on a on a synth. Yeah, so synths. yeah, you got the, the way you yeah. shape that thing. Um, so okay, here's a really common question: which is going to sustain longer, Strat or a Les Paul? I can I can see a cat and hear some pigeons. <laughs> right. Let's do this. So yeah, let's do it. That, so the way we'll do it, we're going to plug you straight into the recording thing. I don't want to go through the amps or anything. No amps, no pedals. No, no nothing. I want guitar. you to plug straight into the recording device and all we're going to hear is the guitar not coloured by anything. I want you to play the same note. I want you to hit it the same strength. And then we're going to put them side by side and we'll see Les Paul or Strat, which one sustains longer. Which pickup shall I use, Dan? Uh, use the bridge pickup. Not the neck pickup? Oh, you're using it. What does, that, that, it doesn't matter. Regardless of the pickup that you use, the magnetic pull won't change. So, okay, the neck pickup will sound less horrible. Let's go for that one. Neck pickup. Okay. All right. So, Dan, I'm going to play an A note. Open okay. A. Open A. I think it's important we play an open string because then it doesn't add the um, physical effect of me touching the string. Yep. I'm going to play it, uh, well... I'm going to try and play it in this at the same place at the same velocity. Okay. Yeah. Yep. 
give or take. Okay. I'll, I'll do my best, okay? okay? Yep, ready? Yep. Everyone ready? Ready. Sure you're ready? Nearly. <laughs> As soon as you can't feel it vibrating anymore. Great. Okay. Strat. Cool. So what, which one did you think sustained longer? The Les Paul. Okay. So it's interesting. In this case, um, we have to get the, the, uh, the wavelengths on, or the waveforms on the screen to have a look at. It's not always the case. In fact, there's a really interesting study. If you go to, it's sci-fi, C-Y-C-F-I dot com. They've done a study. They got really scientific about it. They took um, bolt-on necks, glued on necks and through necks, and pretty much the bolt-on necks always had better sustain. Really? It was really interesting. So the, the idea that a Les Paul has got this incredible sustain over strats is a myth. Yeah. Um, in every case. Well, in, it, you know, it, from guitar, it, it, it's different from guitar to guitar. If you've got like that, so that Murphy Les Paul is so resonant, yeah. you know. Well, I you, guess it, string gauge, <clears throat> How well the nuts cut. Yep. All of these variables. If you pull a guitar out of a river, yeah. you know, all it, it does have how high the action is. All that stuff. Yeah. It all it all makes a difference, but it just goes. It just to say that that you know the idea that you got Les Paul is amazing sustain in a strat isn't isn't is not right. Uh, strats sustain just fine. The, what we'll see now. Have a look at this on the screen though. What you'll see is. That transient, that initial attack of the, the string, and how quickly it decays after that. That was uh, the that's the one constant with both guitars. Exactly. It's like all and then almost nothing straight away. Exactly. There are loads of great examples of this, but I heard this in the car on the way up. Uh, Jimmy Vaughan. So why are you so mean? And you hear it's so plinky. Could be any Jimmy Vaughan record. Yeah, right. Honest. There you go. Yeah. But yeah, it doesn't you know, it's it's so much transient and then it dies off so quick. Yeah. So this is something that with the electric guitar, I guess we've been up against this since the inception. If you think about, um, you know, other plucked instrument like a harpsichord, listen to the harpsichord note and it's the same thing. A piano is a bit different with the, the felt hammer. It, mm. it, it's soft on it, but it's the same sort of thing. However, instruments like, you know, woodwind and, and string uh, bowed instruments, where they, you basically have infinite sustain. So if we want to have that sort of sustain on guitar, it's not just about the instrument. We've got to do something to that. It's a more nuanced argument, isn't it? Because as we've just discovered, listening to the straight sustain of two instruments is pretty much academic. Sure. And largely useless to the application of music. Absolutely. Because at what point in most rock and pop music do we ever just hit a string and, and let it go? Well, for more than about a second, really. Yep. But, you know, a couple of seconds, not many of us are doing that. And most of us are chasing to play notes as fast and as close together <laughs> as possible. Uh, yeah. So what is the point of all this sustain? Absolutely. And so think. let's... Um, uh, Paul Reed Smith, when, you, when he talks about sustain, the reason he talks about sustain is... In his, uh, yeah, the way he sees it, a guitar that doesn't sustain means that it's being impeded by something. Okay. Right? The vibration is being impeded. So the less that the string is being impeded, the more, uh, you know, you get the natural resonance and things of the guitar, the more that's vibrating, the more it's impeded, the less sustain it'll have. So it's not about, you know, this guitar is awesome, 
it sustains for so long. Yeah. It's about this. It sustains. Therefore, it is less. The string is less impeded by other stuff that's going on. Yeah, so the, so the sustaining characteristics of the guitar are potentially a pointer to some other desirable yes. characteristics in what we want that guitar to do. Yes, because if, exactly. If, if we turn that you know academic example of just a straight DI'd guitar sound over and look at the flip side of that coin, it is, we've all probably been stood there at some point or sat there, plugged into an amp where we've gone, hmm, bink, nothing's happening. Or I come to that sustained bit in the solo and it's going away, it's dying. The feel of this stuff that I'm playing isn't really making me feel happy. Yeah. So really sustain then becomes a, a conversation about dynamic yes. and the envelope of the note maybe. Yes, totally. Because if if the if you think about that transit, that initial attack, and with the guitar it's twenty times louder than anything that comes like a second after it. Yeah. Right? Think about Carlos Santana and how he is like he loves those long notes. Now, if all that he had, yeah, if his max volume was the max volume of that initial transit, you wouldn't hear anything after, like, you know, Black Magic Woman, beep, 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 you know, yeah. sound like um, <laughs> MIDI code ed elevator music, yeah, you know. Yeah. So, if we want to get that long sustain, it can't just be about the natural properties of the guitar. Sure. Holdsworth is another great example, oh, isn't it? Man. He, uh, Alan um, Holdsworth, may he rest in peace. Um, his One of his goals was to get really uniform transient. So I was listening to him on the way up today. Yeah. And his Live in Japan album, I think the track is called Home. And it, it was exactly that. It's like, you can see why he liked playing good with guitar synth. Mm. Because it had those sort of properties, you know, uh, so controlled and so uniform, just far out. So we've got Jimmy Vaughan over there. <laughs> yeah. Like oh, literally it's... all attack, no sustain. And that's great. And then we've got Holdsworth over there, uniform. Everything in the middle is about what we're going to talk about next. We've got six examples, I think, of ways in which you can manipulate sustain on your guitar yes. to get the feel that you want. And hopefully we'll get into that uh, through these examples. Yep, perfect. Okay. Number one, really simple, volume. I'm so interested in this. As you know, Dan and I like to play loud. And it's where I, the magic is, baby. I have a belief that the guitar is a fundamentally different instrument at volume. Totally. Than it is quietly, which is not to say better, it's to say different. I'll say better. <laughs> and a lot of that is about what we're going to talk about next. Yep. So for this example, we're just going to use a two rock. Um, You'll hear it quietly, we'll turn the volume up and we will adjust the volume in the recording machine so that what you hear in your ears is more or less the same thing. And then when I post-process the audio, I will make sure it's the same volume in your ears or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. um, but what you should hear, well, let's see what we hear. Okay. So I'll turn the victory off for a minute. So here's the two rock. Um, it's set very quietly, as you'll be able to see from the dB meter. We never play this quietly. It's probably peaking just below 80 dB. Okay. Yep. So, sustain, uh, the attack, decay, sustain, and then release. Hold on to one of those notes for a bit longer. Yeah, quickly that dies off. Yeah, I mean it's not. I mean, it's not bad. You you still get that. You get the. You still get that sustain. Yeah. But it's like. Nee. I've heard much worse at eighty dB. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure. But let's see what happens to that note when we turn the amp up and give it some volume.
That's it really interesting. So, mm -hmm. first off, that relate that heavy relationship of strong attack and immediately dying away is still there. Yes. That doesn't really change. No. But obviously, because it's louder, it may well be that the guitar is sustaining just as long when it's quiet. But there's quite a bit of louder. But you can't hear it. Sure. So the amp's louder. So of course you can hear it sustaining longer. Sure. That's number one. Number two, immediately you are reacting to the amp. To the amp. You yeah. turn towards it. Yeah. You're smiling. Yeah. And then what then happened was there was a harmonic relationship between... And there was a whole bunch of different overtones that, that I thought I could hear. Absolutely. So the, the, so that is when you start to get this symbiotic relationship happening between the amplifier and the guitar. Yeah. It's no longer just this. It's, you know, it, you start to get this interaction. Mm. And we're sort of on the edge of the next thing we're going to talk about, feedback. Yeah, because I it's really interesting. We are going to talk about feedback now, obviously, because that's... It, even though that was a pretty clean sound, yes. it was kind of starting to happen you on some hear, of those notes. You, you yeah. could hear an, a harmonic interplay uh, between what you were playing. Yeah. So, volume then, and I think certainly in the case of guitars like, well, any guitar really, but there is no doubt whatsoever that playing louder is going to increase your audible sustain for two principal reasons. One, because it's louder. So by the time it's decayed, however many dB, you can still hear it. Mm -hmm. But two, because that harmonic interplay is causing something else to happen totally. that doesn't happen at low volume. Totally. Yep. Very prosaic example, but I think it explained yeah. it. Yeah. Well, I mean, the reality is at the moment, we haven't really changed the gain structure. We've just made it louder. So, <laughs> so, so if we if we now start to mess with the gain structure, so apart from so we've inc increased the amplitude. Now what we're going to do is we're going to start limiting that signal. We're going to push the signal, uh, the amplifier into overdrive, so it can only amplify the signal to a point, and then it starts to limit. Yeah, we're obviously going to use a pedal for this as well. But sure. Um, so we're on to things, the thing one was volume, things two and three are harmonic feedback and overdrive and distortion. Yep. yep. Okay. Yep. Um, Shall we go to two amps, Daniel? Yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. So we're just setting a level for the next thing and even turning the second amp on, there's yet more of that interesting harmonic interplay, which is... Totally. It's clean feedback. Yep. Isn't it? Yep, totally. Okay, shall we um, invoke the preamp mark two? Sure. To get some um, extra gain going. Yep. And that will lead us on to the next thing we're going to talk about as well. So um, obviously adding gain first of all, is going to increase your sustain. Where is mm -hmm. it down uh, there? That's the one. is so interesting. The dB meter will be telling the story that actually the transients were no louder. You're right. I don't think. I don't know what you peaked at when you were playing clean there. I think it was up in the high 90s. Right. 
and that was the, what, what, when you hit the A chord, so all the bass frequencies as well, we mm -hmm. hit 102. So as far as the dB meter is concerned, it's really not much louder right. or no louder, and yet the sustain, we pitched the gain right on the edge there so that it was starting to feed back. Sure. So what were you feeling? Well, yeah, because we are now into limiting with this, the, the first thing that like overdrive will do is crush those transients. So it'll hit, it'll crush the transients, we hear, uh, but then as the natural note of the sustain, the transients die off, um, the, you know, you're here, um, we don't get that initial attack and decay, it's more uniform, and mm. then it'll start to, you know, fade out. However, because we've got the, um, that initial sustain, and because we've got, it's louder and it's limiting, we start to get this feedback loop happening. So the vibration from the amplifier, from the speaker, the sound pressure levels from the speaker, start to interact with, because we've got the same resonant frequency of the stream, right? So you now if, if I'm playing a, a C here, we've got the C coming out there, that's activating the C here. And if the guitar is resonant also at that frequency, that's gonna help. There are times when if it's not that loud, and there are sort of uh, spots that are on the guitar that are less alive, it's harder to get those notes going. Go up in semitones then. Play the, I don't know, the A string, for example. Yep. I'll give you a tiny bit more gain. Yep. Um, and turn the preamp on. Okay. And let's see which ones ring and which ones don't. Okay. So at this level, we've got that, you know, the D really takes off. There's certain, we could get infinite sustain on other certain notes, but that D took off and went up into, yeah. you know, into octaves. So what I'll do now, which was just to increase the volume a little bit and again a little bit more, and then you'll start to hear other things pop out um, as the other notes start to pick up more energy. So. <laughs> So just just now so now what we're doing is we're we are using that volume and the gain and the um that limiting and it starts bringing out all these harmonics. And now watch what happens when you change guitars, especially with something for a bit of with a bit of air in it. separate bunch of frequencies yep. because, why? The interaction between the speaker and the guitar. Now, this is all very good. All, we, all we've done here is gone, well, this is how you do harmonic feedback. You turn everything up, turn the gain up, and let the guitar howl. Why is this relevant to a conversation on sustain? And I think it's because when you come back from that moment of feedback is where it starts to get really interesting. Right, just taking that... Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, okay. which is which is where the gain thing comes in. And of course, um, because what happens before feedback is 
sustain with no feedback. So if we just pull the gain back a bit. It's still there. It's still uh, totally. You can still hear the interaction of the pickups and the speaker. Yep. And the gain is what brings it out. So I guess, obviously, get louder, more sustain. Add gain, you get sustain, and it's changing the envelope of the note completely and yep. adding harmonic content. Yes. So before we move on, ought we talked about EQ? Yes. So what we've got in the um, preamp mark two is a sweepable mid frequency band. Yeah. So Dan, if I could get you to play, and you'll find that I'll find some points. Yes. Well, I'll see if I can find some points. I'm going to assume that I can find some points. Um, so we'll turn it on. We'll make it post. There's these two sliders here you're looking at, but it'd be obvious from what I'm doing. <laughs> Unreal! <laughs> Definitely starting to go through me a bit. But, you know, where have we heard that down the years? Tube Screamers, very famously, this um, mid hump, sort of five to seven hundred hertz, yeah. really key for bringing out those kind of harmonic feedback characteristics. Cocktoires, sure. Same thing. Um, what would, if we just try this for one second? I'm going to stick this. This is the um, the, the Zenith one. It's got it's got a um, it's a boost with EQ and compression. Yep. If I put on the 500 hertz, let's go to a guitar that doesn't want to howl at every possible resonant frequency. Nice. Um, so if we turn the e the the mids off on the uh, Mark II. Yeah. That's it. Great. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to we'll find that frequency and I'll kick that on after the Mark II and see cool. what happens. Okay. Okay. Give so it, it's a bit more because it's uh, you know this. Um. Is insanely loud. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's boosting that specific frequency yeah. that is going to make that thing take off. Yeah. So, with, um, yeah, it's not adding any particular uh, overdrive or anything like that. It's just boosting that overdriven frequency. It does, it reminds me when I stopped playing there, I could hear my acoustic guitar resonating in the background because I was playing a. I was playing an A. Right. And, and that, was the, that was the frequency that picked up. And what I heard on the acoustic guitar was. Sympathetic resonance. And a, a, 
an octave above that, yeah. that's where it was resonating. As a complete tangent, that is how notch filters work in feedback suppression for acoustic guitars. So if you find out, if you're on stage and you know it's howling at 800 hertz, for example, you pick a really tight frequency, you take that 800 out, it can't resonate there anymore, and that's what stops the feedback. Yeah, right. That's how intelligent feedback filters work. It's, it's the opposite of what we've just done. It's also why trying guitars out in a guitar store sounds so great because you hit an A and every guitar that's hung up in the store starts resonating. You go, yeah, man, I'm unreal. And you get home and you play it and you go, oh, it doesn't quite sound like it did. It. Yeah. So there you go. Uh, you, obviously volume, obviously gain, but EQ is a really key one and it's another reason why something like a Tube Screamer is so popular for for trying that. If you've got an EQ pedal, focus on those frequencies kind of 400 to 1k mm -hmm. and boost them and that's where you'll find a lot of harmonic feedback. Yep. And it, much above that and it's kind of like, uh, but certainly up there is where you'll start getting the thing. And again, it doesn't have to be about screaming feedback the whole time. Sure. These things happen with lower gain for a bit more feel back through the guitar. Yep. Um, just And just to complete the gain thing, I want to turn the rat on and make it really distorted. So basically, what we're going to get is no... We're going to basically slice off like most of the transient, mm -hmm. most of the attack, and it will just give us that long sustained note until, until right at the end where we get that natural um, release. But what we're here is the... Um, the signal will go in and be turned up so much and the forward voltage of those diodes will cut everything else off and just clip everything really hard no, no so way. we get that long sustained thing. So if you think of the, the, the waveform that we see on the screen, imagine that 10 times higher, yeah? And what we're doing is slicing off everything um, above, you know, whatever um, amplitude we're going for and, and that's what we're going to get. So if you play this for us, Very different experience from So yeah, that's how we get that, you know, that sustain. And because it's producing so many, so much harmonics, you're getting that content back. Yeah. And as, as that's interacting with the guitar as well. So uh, yeah, like distortion fuzz, when you get to that level, that's another way of affecting the guitar. So we get that sustain. So now we're into, I mean, all along we're into the discussion of it's not just about how long the note decays for, mm. the sustain of the note. It's about at what frequencies and at what amplitude. -tude. Yeah. I always say amplitude because the IK multimedia software. So what we've done so far with volume and EQ is manipulate and gain, is manipulate the shape of that wave yes. as it sustains. Yes. But of course, not everyone wants a load of gain and crazy harmonic feedback, what a lot of people want is just a really nice guitar sound that's a bit cleaner, that sustains. So of course, what are we into now, Dan? We're into compression. Yeah. And really we've been talking about compression ever since the start of the show. Of course. Yep. That's totally. what, the reason that we DI'd the guitar for the Les Paul Strat test was because we wanted to bypass the compression and limiting and shaping that 
From you start, yeah, from here. That guitarists yeah. do. Yeah. So let's talk a bit about compression then. Um, what do you say about compression, Dan? I say compression is the overdrive for your clean sound. Ba boom. Ba boom. Yeah. Yeah. So what that's going to do, if you think well, we were talking about how our signal was was being amplified and clipped, and and you know those hard edges are what give us that distortion. What the compressor does is. Well, if you think about our transients, what it's looking for is the threshold. Like, so as the signal goes above the threshold, there's our, that's where we're going to compress, right? The ratio is how much we're going to compress that. Um, the attack is how fast we compress that. And the sustain is how long we're going to compress that for. And then, you know, release time. So there's your, your basic studio compressor. Um, if you think about the, the limiter, limiter does that really hard. So yeah. anything above the threshold is like whoosh, done. A compressor, we have some options with our ratio. So, um, you know, it colors the sound a bit more. But the really interesting thing with the compressor is it doesn't distort the signal. Yeah. The same way that, a, you, know, it, it, it's, you know, it keeps as much of that note intact as possible. There's a bunch of different ways to do it, um, which is why there are so many compressors out there, and they each have their own thing, you know, optical compression, and you know, th th loads of different ways. Yeah, we we have done shows on compressors in the past, and yep. we will do more if you're confused about what compressor to buy. Yeah. Um, but what we'll do, we're going to stick the Empress on. I used the Empress in a the Gilmore video I did a little while ago, the Fraser like Gilmore video. I was so impressed with this thing, um, but it also has some LED, so we can see exactly what's going on. We can see what's on. happening. So, um, if you you play for me for a second, we'll just go. And this is, this is the straight clean sound. Yep, both amps, because yep. we like that. <laughs> You're good to go. So there's still, still sustain there mm. without it on, but yes. the nature of the sustain is just fundamentally different. And anyone that uses a compressor, this will seem like the most obvious thing anyone's ever said in the world. But by golly, does it change the feel underneath your... It really does. And some people like it and some people don't. Has it, it is... got a blend on it, that one? Yes, it does. Yeah. So um, we'll do that in a second. But So essentially we're compressing really hard there. Yeah. Um, but it does that thing to the to the front of the note, mm. so you, you you lose a lot of that initial transient response, a lot of that initial attack, 
Um, we can change that by how fast we let the compressor attack the note. Yep. But, you know, so what that's doing is it's changing the tone. With your initial attack, right, when you don't have it on, it still sustains, but it's just like this. You know, you, you have that, that your amplitude going down like this. Whereas with that on, it's so even for like, like a, a, an extended period of time. And it's amazing, even if you're playing notes that are, you know, a milli, you know, half a second, quarter of a second apart, just not having that little bits of decay in those notes is huge. It's, yeah. you get, it's almost like keyboardy type things where it's like you hit a note and say, mm, 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 and you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like really even and smooth. So that's what the compressors are really great at. Um, you know, if you think about, you know, I guess uh, Mark Knopfler, Salt and Swing and those sorts of sound with those yeah. clean, long notes. Can it's we all about compression. Can we try something then? So for me, that it, it sounds too overtly compressed. Yes. Can you mix back in some of my... Original signal? Original signal. Yep. And then um, I'm all, I, we'll do that. Then I want to turn the reverb on as well. Um, because I think where most of us live, so we've gone from like really crazy heavy gain, uh, too much gain, too much feedback. Come on, all I want is a nice guitar sound that's sort of with a little bit of overdrive on it. Yep. And um, so, and that doesn't feel squashed sure. to hell. So maybe let's get something there with the compressor and then we'll turn on some mild overdrive and see how that's feeling. Beautiful. From a sustain point of view. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yep. Okay. Um... So more to the left is my more dry to the left signal. Is your dry signal. And then more to the right is your compressed signal. Cool. So give me completely dry and just put a little bit in. I reckon that'll be enough because then when we hit it with the overdrive. Yeah, yeah. It'll compress more because it's getting hit more. Okay. I'm gonna just turn the gain down a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Asking me to hit the guitar hard. Right. Let's turn the compressor off for a sec. where you're going to really hear the benefit of that is at lower volume. Absolutely. Because we've got the harmonic we do. going on, so that's just another bit of feel. 
Final thing, sorry. Just to say, that's why um, like low volume uh, rigs, compressors are magic. You know, lots of people when they get their compressors on, they get them at home and they're like, oh, this is amazing. They get out to the gig, it's live, it's like, where's it all gone? Exactly. That's, so personally, I'm not a massive fan of compressors for that very reason. Yeah. Which is why having that blend knob there, yeah. and you, you, you re can retain the initial attack of your pick and everything else, so it feels nice, yeah. or at least it feels familiar, but then the compressor kind of comes in behind that sure. and gives you the sustain. Yeah. Before we talk about another type of compression, I just want to add the one thing that I can't live without that I think is, a, is sustain in its own right. Which is reverb. Yeah, totally. So I'll turn some on on the um, two rock, and I'll turn a little bit on in the victory as well, so it doesn't sound weird. It being only on in one amp. Uh, so we'll just go back to that sound we had, yeah. That was kind of a bit of everything. Bit Beautiful. of volume, bit of gain, bit of compression, compression, bit of harmonic feedback, even though it wasn't a high gain sound. Yeah. Lovely. That's nice. That, for me, is the place where you feel a bit more confident yep. in just laying back a bit, letting the guitar do a bit more work. Totally. Because perhaps one of the key things that you're looking for with, with sustain is exactly that. Sure. Another quick thing with uh, with compression is that um, at the amps we've got here, excuse me, they've got, you know, when you hit them hard, they break up really nicely. If you've got an amp that has got loads and loads of headroom, you know, high watts and that sort of thing, that's where compressors are almost essential. Yeah. You know what I mean? Otherwise, it's you know, it can be like plugging into a PA where you get those transients and nothing else after. The compressors really come into their own. Um, uh, David Gilmore with his high watts, you know, uses compressors a lot for that sort of sound to get his sustain with those amplifiers. You know, he's, he's used loads, MXRs, and he's used um, Boss CS2s and blah, blah, blah. Um, but yeah, those, those amplifiers that have got tons of headroom is where compressors really... I think also the louder you go and the more you hit the compressor, a little goes a long way. Totally. Everything changes with, I mean, everything changes with volume anyway. Yep. But particularly with compression. Yep. So I guess it's one of those pedals where you turn it on, you go, is it doing anything? It's like, oh boy, it's doing something. Yeah. Whereas, you know, you've got your Dynacomp on maximum <laughs> squash and you get that up at crazy volume and it's like, whoa, where, where's it gone? Totally. Um, so that's making me think, right? So. Here we are talking about a pedal compressing and changing that envelope of the note in order to give us more sustain. Yes. Where we began, I think, was talking about Strat and the Les Paul. Yes. And one of the things that seemed to define the difference in the two, perhaps, was the relationship of that envelope. Yeah, totally. So natural compression from pickups. Yep, totally. Or at least natural uh, envelope from pickups. Okay. I had a chat to Tim Mills about this from Bare Knuckle Pickups. Mm -hmm. It was fascinating. 
And he was saying that one of the reasons that, that guys who like to play fast and do a lot of legato stuff, one of the reasons they like using high gain pickups is that the pickups basically reach their full potential a lot quicker. Hmm. So less dynamic range. And basically it's a form of compression. Yep. So when they're playing their legato stuff, it's, it's really smooth coming straight from the guitar. Uh, as opposed to having to do a bunch of stuff post, you know, they've got that, you know, high gain pickups, um, basically, you know, reach that output level really quickly. So, if, you know, playing fast and that sort of stuff works really, really well with those sort of, you know, humbucking high gain pickups. It makes a lot of sense, uh, not least that having grown up playing these things with, you know, weak, very high transient. Yep. Massive uh, dynamic range. Yeah, to begin with, I've I've personally really struggled to play those pickups. Yeah, because I sort of do that, and I'm like, well, where's where's the edge of my pick gone, and yeah. and stuff like that. How, how does the Les Paul fare in this regard? Then I mean, to be honest, not awesome because it's th these are path style things. But um, you'll you'll still hear. We just play a couple of notes. Yeah, and you'll still hear that the attack is very different. Yeah, and the the way it. The, the, the decay is very different as well. So we're going to keep the compressor off for the time uh, being? Just, yeah, just put the preamp on. Put the preamp on. I'll go on the bridge pickup for a second then. Yep. Um, go on in. Can you hear the front end of your note? It's so different to this. You've got this real clicking, bat, you know. So that transient is really different. Yeah. So you imagine this with, you know, much higher output pickups, and it's releasing, it's, it's reducing that transient, giving you more output. Let's put the compressor on then. Okay. Let me turn up the attack speed. Try again. So it's, atta it's, it's attacking this one faster as well. Um, I'm, I'm glad to see that Four months of being off the air hasn't stopped me talking over the reverb drums, Dan. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know you miss me. Um, <laughs> As it, and the more you pile the gain on, the more the difference between those two becomes apparent, because this will stay, keep more attack on the front of the note a lot longer than that one will. Sure, I, and, but it'll get, to an, <clears throat> it'll, it'll get to a point where it it's completely saturated. This yeah. will saturate quicker than that, Yeah, you know what I mean? But then it'll get to a point where you keep adding gain on, and then that will no longer cut through. Yeah. It's the reason why um, fuzzes work so well with strats because they've got so much gain, but the that initial transient of those single coils can cut through with those fuzzes. It's much more difficult with these. And again, the reason why these work so well with tone benders because they cut out the bottom end. So and the bottom end, yeah, yeah. There, you know, the frequency thing all is, part of it. It's so fundamental to the whole discussion, totally. isn't it? Because that, everything we've been talking about, you know, right from the top, sustain ostensibly is, hit the note, how long does it take? Yep. A actually, what we're saying with guitar is, yeah, sure, but it's more complex than that. For one reason, we're not really interested in how long it takes because we're, it's time to play the next note before you get anywhere near it. Yeah. What we are interested in is how it decays, uh, in what manner, and what the harmonic interplay is 
with that note. And then of course, the physicality of the guitar, the pedals you're using, the EQ, everything else then really, and to my mind, shapes the sound of your guitar fundamentally. Think about, think about the harmonics that are coming from the instrument. Yeah. If you start dampening this down, the first thing that goes is those harmonics. Yeah. You know, so yeah. Well, proven, absolutely proven beyond doubt with a hollow body guitar. Totally. Because totally. it's all got room to dance around there. Totally. Okay, let's finish off with some tricks. Okay. Um, there's two tricks I can think of. Okay. What you got? I've got. Right, my trick is the sustainer in my um, EOB strat. So think about think about your pickup. You've got a you know, let's go back to GCSE physics. You've got your coil of wire around a magnet. Move a piece of steel inside that magnetic field, and you create a voltage. Right, that voltage is basically exactly what happens to the pickup. Let's reverse that. Let's stick the voltage into that coil of wire around the magnet, and then you get the inverse where that magnetic field can move that string. So that's what's happening here. And if Mr. Good is watching, uh, my GCSE physics teacher from Foster School, if, if you're still kicking, Mr. Good, um, the blank look on my face at this point <laughs> will resonate deeply with you, as it did 31 years ago. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's, for, you know, I think when Ed had this made, because he'd been using sustainer for a while and he just, he was able to get, you, you know, obviously we've had him on the show and we've seen what he can do with effects. So this became a signal generator mm -hmm. for him to enable him to, you know, create the sounds and obviously move the signal around melodically and, and, you know, then turn it off and he's back to his Strat sounds. Yeah. Um, but if, the... if anyone's um, slightly dubious about this at this point, Dan, could you, without amplifying the guitar, turn the sustainer on? Totally. So just no, literally purely acoustically. Turn... Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll turn the sustainer on. Let me just turn to mute everything. So that's plugged in. Maybe hold it up closer to the mic. Okay. So just to prove it is physically making that string resonate, where are the extra harmonics coming from? So you've got um, the switches here, so uh, that will change the voltage going to the coil and, you know, so you know, creating those different, I guess, the different resonant frequencies. Yeah. Um, but the harmonics are literally exciting the string to vibrate in a way that creates the harmonics from the guitar itself. Absolutely. There's no, it's not creating the harmonic from the pickup. No. It's not, the, the only sound you're hearing is the string vibration and the harmonics therein. Exactly. So, is that kind of a similar job as to what's happening when your amplifier is loud? and it's making the strings vibrate and create harmonics. Uh, 
yeah, it's all related. All those, the, the way the harmonics get amplified and stuff, it's, it's all related. Uh, it's like, um, you know, your speaker really is a microphone. In reverse. In reverse, you know yeah. what I mean? So it's, it's, in that way, it's all related. Interesting. Interesting. Um, so yeah, if you, for, certainly for the kind of ambient tones that Ed uses, uh, it doesn't work quite so well as a kind of, you're just playing rock and roll and you want a bit more sustain. It's not really no, for that, is no, it? No, no, you, no. It because, requires a bit more Well, the depth. notes go past too quick yeah. with rock and roll. This is, this is getting long, sustained notes. Yeah. You know, and you've got to give it a bit of something to get it going. Yeah. Uh, but it's but when you do, it's man, it's it's hours of fun. Well, similarly, um, many years ago there was a product called the Ebo, um, which is a a string manipulator in a similar way. T TC Electronic brought out something called the Eon. Right. Um, more recently, I have literally never used it. Okay. So um, let's see. You put the battery in. You turn the light on. It is now operational. Okay. And then you hold it over the string. Should we see, Dan? Yeah. I think you need to find a magnetic part of the, the, the coil and the pickup. And yeah, it's depending on where it is with, in relation to the magnetic field. I'm all magnetic, me. Turn off, turn off a minute. See what happens. Make sure clothes smell of broken biscuits. Thank you, Jonah. Whale swimming up to the door. <laughs> Somebody with a bit more creative um, ability and uh, musical um, oh, ability. That's, fine, that's me. Would uh, would probably be able to do something more interesting with that. <laughs> <laughs> if you're throwing something at the screen now, please don't break your screen. Uh, cool. Boom. Tricks. Sustain. Okay. Sustain. 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 Every guitar right. review mentions it. We all think it's really important. Mm. What does it mean? Yeah. What does sustain mean? So the next question somebody, uh, when someone says, wow, my guitar sustains really well, what, in what way, under what circumstances, yep. manipulated by what, yep. and to what effect? What is that sustain doing for you? Is it giving you harmonic feedback? Is it just making everything a bit easier? Hmm. Is it so that when you hit that big bend in the ballad, the second last song before the break? Play Robbie Williams' Angels! <laughs> There you go. Well, there's one that's got a sustain, hasn't it? And every totally. time you play it, it goes ba ba da do ba. Like a banjo. Ding ding a ding ding ding. Yeah. You know what's its function? And hopefully, what we've said is that some combination of volume, 
gain. Yep. EQ. Yes. Compression. Yes. And physical manipulation in other ways. Yep. Not least the physical characteristics of the guitar in the first place. Mm -hmm. Some combination of all of those things may help you get to a point of improved sustain, whatever that means. Yep. Very good. Yeah. Man, that was fun. It really was actually. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, please subscribe if you haven't already subscribed. Also, a massive thank you to our preferred retailers. Uh, in Australia is... Uh, Pedal Empire of Brisbane, Queensland. Uh, our dear friends in the UK and also look after Europe. Would be uh, Danish Pete and the captain and all the lovely people at Anderson's Music who just raised nearly £118,000 for the Teenage Cancer Trust in an astonishing piece of Incredible. Work. Thank Incredible. you. Yep. Um, there are also some links in the description below. Yep. Um, take you to sweetwater.com. If you click on one of those links and um, buy something, they send private jets full of gold bullion that land on our airstrip. At our gold clonchet mansion. And we're using to make the gold clonchet mansion. You so, better um, believe it. Yeah, riches like you've never known. <laughs> a massive thank you to our patrons on Patreon. Um, thank you guys. So grateful for all your support. Thank you. Also, um, massive thank you to anyone that's gone to uh, that comes to, to VCQ on Mondays and hangs out with us. Yeah. It'll be really interesting this Monday having a chat about this and hearing about your um, experiences with sustain. And if you have certain guitars that just sustain forever naturally, it'd be yeah. really interesting. And if you care. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> um, and finally, anyone that's gone to thatpedalshowstore.com and grabbed t-shirts and strings and pedals and hats and it's all there. All that stuff. Uh, yep. That's how we fund this show predominantly. So um, please do that. Yeah, really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Have a fantastic day and we'll see you on Monday at VCQ. Cheerio. Cheers, guys. Bye. Bye.